Well, hello, Bible scholars. Good to see you all on the internet and good to be with my esteemed colleagues here for our study this evening. We're so happy that you are taking the time to be part of this journey with us. We invite your input and dialogue as we share together. And uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right in tonight. I'm going to have an opening prayer for us and then. Uh, Doc is going to take us away with Psalm 51, a very familiar psalm to many of us. And uh, let's pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us tonight. God, what a gift prayer is. Prayers for ourselves, prayer for praise, prayer for confession, prayer for illumination, asking you to help us to see, to light the path you would have us to go so clearly that we don't even have to ask, is this the right way? We ask now that you uh, still our hearts and minds, all of us who listen to these words, and give us the message for us individually. Give us miracles of your divine intervention to guide our lives through this study that we will be molded and made more in your image as we spoke of last week, as you are the potter and we are the clay. We pray for all of our loved ones who are near and dear to our hearts, special prayer concerns for healing and wholeness and grace on their lives. We ask you now, come, O oh Jesus, in the name of that precious one we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, my good doctor friend, would you talk to us a little bit about uh, Psalm 51? I will. I would love to. This, uh, I bring you greetings from the great state of Florida via Zoom. Uh, absolutely amazing that, that uh, we can be together as Christians yes. to enjoy sharing uh, tonight. Uh, Psalm 51, uh, the stage was set for, for Psalm 51 back in 1 Samuel, and most of you are very familiar with the story, and I'll hit just the high spots in the story as we talk about, about the uh, scripture tonight. Um, King David has, has sinned. He has uh, uh, looked upon Bathsheba and he has uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then uh, uh, as some would probably consider uh, as he eliminated Bathsheba's husband so that he could have Bathsheba or hide his terrible sin, uh, you don't hide these things very well. Not only does he is he exposed to his own people, he will be exposed before God. Uh, you don't, you never hide what is in your heart and what you commit from God. And the prophet Nathan comes to King David and tells King David what he has done, what a terrible thing he has done. And this is David pouring out his heart to God when he realizes what an awful thing he has done. So let's read the first part of Psalm 51 from the NIV. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
May God bless to each of us his reading of his holy word. Um, a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit real. The situation that that uh, King David finds himself in, and I thought what I would do was just sort of do this in an outline form, uh, jumping from topic to topic to topic. Um, without filling in between the outlines very much. And what I noticed was that in the beginning, when the sin was committed, God is a minor player at first. He's not something that David is thinking about. He's thinking about other things. Okay. David is thinking about Bathsheba. And he's thinking about Uriah the Hittite. These are the major players in the uh, in the beginning. God is the only person to be a major player in the end. Wow. He starts out leaving God out of the decisions that he makes. And he ends up on his knees before God trying to deal with the awful thing that he has done. So what happened? King David has a visual of um of Bathsheba he loses self-control he has the ego of a king everybody worships him he did not listen to God's warning and he followed the wrong emotions what happened what happened was a secret pregnancy then there were attempts to make Uriah think that he fathered a child but Uriah apparently a very, very good man, has enormous pressure from David to spend time with Bathsheba. He, he's out doing battle against, uh, uh, against the enemies uh, of, um, of Israel. And David says, oh, you can come home and spend time with your wife. But Uriah has great integrity and feelings of patriotism, and he stays with his men to defend the city. So King David establishes a commander-in-chief, an executive order that places Uriah in a position where Uriah stands a very high probability of losing his life. And he does. So then King David takes Bathsheba as his wife. So how do King David's friends respond? Well, they lose faith in him. And King David was young. He had a culmination of early establishment of integrity of King David. And David was one of eight brothers, son of Jesse. And he was fighting that huge Philistine Goliath mm -hmm. in 1 Samuel 17. So David has no fear while God is directing him. That's the key. He defended his father's flocks. He took hold of the lion and the bear by the neck and literally wrung their necks. So, so David and God together were absolutely undefeatable. David was a fierce fighter when he had God on his side. God was not a major player in David's fall with Bathsheba. David's rather public tryst with Bathsheba because his man knew what people around him knew what he was doing. And he wow. had this tryst with Bathsheba and it caused his integrity and his trust with man to be lost. If you look in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and I know Jennifer will love this. Yes. We hear an opportunity in there where a lifetime of establishing character and integrity can be lost in an instant. And this is what has happened here. He spent his entire life becoming one of the greatest men of God, and he let it all slip away because of a lack of self-control. So why does God even allow David to keep, keep Bathsheba? David has suffered terribly after he realizes what he's done because of his sin with Bathsheba and the fact that literally he sent Uriah to his death. As a result of this, 
David loses four children. The baby that he conceived with Bathsheba dies. Absalom, his brother, uh, his son, killed yeah. Amnon, his other, other son. Then Absalom was killed. And then David loses Adonijah. So he loses four children. He loses the respect of his people. He loses his amazing reputation. So after his sins, David thoroughly repented. He stayed on his face night and day for seven days in genuine contrition and grief, praying to God. He begs God for mercy. Well, David is allowed to keep Bathsheba because she's lost her husband and she's lost her baby because of him. He was the powerful king. He took advantage of one of his subjects. So God forgave them. I don't know what man did, but God forgave them. And God at this point in time in Psalm 51 becomes the major player. At this point in time, we see when we confess our sins before God, he is faithful and just to forgive them. Yeah. He forgave them and he granted them another child. And this child was named Solomon. And Solomon was named Solomon because that name means peace. And peace was established through Solomon. David was the son of Jesse. Solomon was his son, both ancestors of our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. So God has grace and forgiveness, even for terrible sins. So we, but we must have genuine repentance in order to return to him. Deep, sincere repentance, because God sees our inmost thoughts in our hearts. He knows if we are sincere or not. We can be outwardly sincere and inwardly not sincere. David was inwardly sincere. The sin of David is a particularly atrocious sin. It is implied that the greater the sin, the greater the mercies it takes to cover the sin. In Hebrew, the noun implies that, that God will need to wash him abundantly to get David clean because this sin stain is deep. Mm. The stain will require multiple washing, <clears throat> multiple repentance, um, a lot of communication with God. This is not a problem for God, but as a sinner, we become desperate for God to deliver us from the terrors of our own consciences. So David's sin is ever before him. He can't get it off his mind. And David has had a lifelong relationship with God. So King David knows that he sinned against his great friend, God. Wow. Who's let God down. God has shared things with David that are secret to the rest of us. David was special to God and David has really let God down and disappointed God. So only God can pardon him. Only God can make the anguish of sin go away. Only God can pardon us. So since David has sinned against God, David not only confesses his sins before man, who is very slow to forgive, but from before God, who saw the sin even as it was being committed, we don't hide anything from God. So David committed this sin before the judge of judges. No witnesses need come forward. He convicted himself before God. We must not lose track of the fact that God judges the thoughts of the heart. So man's forgiveness was not sufficient for King David. He needed, he must have the forgiveness of God. The judgment of God was in itself an intolerable burden. So God's righteousness is apparent even in the sins of men. God's truth overrides our attempts at falsehood. God is never unjust. 
the enemies of the church may proclaim, look at this pillar of the church, David Paul. Look at that. He's just a hypocrite. Yeah. What are those who look to him, to him for leadership? But what does David do? David takes all the blame, saying, I am guilty of this sin. So Paul in Romans 3, 3 and 4, tells it God, of God's faithfulness, that it is unaffected by the fact that the Jews broke his covenant. Mm -hmm. God made a covenant, and he never breaks his covenant. Yeah, that's amazing. But you better not blame God for your transgressions. Instead, be profoundly thankful for God's mercy. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's a great insight. That was wonderful, Doc. Mm. Goodness gracious. I love that you tied in God's faithfulness. That's something I pulled out of the uh, my study time, too, on that one. It, it, in one of the writers I, I read on this patch is, this story is even more, it's more about God's faithfulness than David's sinfulness. Wow. He's faithful to us. Beautifully said. Thank you, brother. We're going to give you a pass. We're going to give Love you a pass. Rest not. We love you. Go love on your family and enjoy a good supper. They're smiling yes. at me. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Aussie, hello. Good. Good night. Good night. See you, brother. Right. Good night. Well, uh, that was a great um, kickoff to our – now we're in football season, Jennifer. I got to stop talking about baseball analogies, and I got to go to football. <laughs> um. It's always baseball season if you're a Mississippi State Bulldog, though, isn't it, Jen? Or Rebel. Well, <laughs> kind of. We're still kinda. trying to catch it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Mississippi's doing their thing, aren't they? Southern may do it next year. Who knows? They do. Somebody's going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Well, I have the great privilege of reading Paul's letter to his brother, and some might would say son, in the faith, Timothy. Um, so we this is the first chapter from uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. And following my, my uh, colleague and my brother in the faith, Norris, there, I'll give a little bit of background. So Paul is, not only is he ministering to Timothy, but he is also reminding him, and I guess the other listeners, and certainly us today, uh, of the challenges of false faith, you know, of, of, of uh, wrongful beliefs or doctrine, for that matter, if we want to say those words. Um, so that's kind of the underlying root of this passage, and these are Paul's inter introductory comments leading into his uh, ministry and mentoring of Timothy. So I'm going to read here from chapter one in first Timothy verses 12 through verse 17. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful. There's that word again and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Um, I really appreciated the reflection of one of the scholars that I studied in preparation for this text that reminded us. Now, many of us that are familiar with Paul's writings, uh, his epistles, his letters, um, 
and his sermons, Paul often begins his letter with giving thanks for those he's writing to, correct? The recipients. Even last week, as we heard of Philemon or Philemon, um, where Paul began that by giving thanks for Onesimus, uh, who had been his friend and his uh, child in the faith as well. Paul, this week, you have to catch it. We have to listen with fresh ears. Instead of giving thanks for the listener, for Timothy, he gives thanks for himself for what he has received through God's grace. Wow, isn't that a great place to start, babe? Yes, we want to be thankful for our family, for our brothers and sisters of the faith and our countless uh, gifts that God has given us in the other. But let us not forget what God has done for us. And those is the essence of how Paul begins this letter. God has given me above all else forgiveness, deliverance, from my sin, from myself, from my selfishness, from my brokenness, restoration. Um, so he says, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful. Can you imagine the grace in this? Paul, for all practical purposes, invented the word grace in the New Testament uh, scriptures, that abundance of love, uh, undeserving love, I've said on more than one occasion, I'll share it tonight with you all too, a summary of grace, mercy, and providence. Grace, um, God giving to us what we don't deserve. Mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. And providence, God giving us what we don't even ask for or even have a concept of at times. So Paul is overwhelmed with God's faithfulness. Doc hit on that in the words of the Psalm reading tonight too, that God was faithful even when David was not, even when Paul was not. Uh, and not only, I mean, y'all wrestle with this one. Not only did God forgive Paul, but let, let's think about this. The, in, the way he entrusted him, the way he, he found, he put his faith in Paul. Not only was God faithful in his action, but he put his faith in Paul. Here's what I mean. You know, if, uh, let's say, we'll, I'm going to go back to baseball analogy again. You know, if a, uh, a pitcher goes out onto the mound and blows the game, messes up, well, it's one thing for the coach to forgive them. You know, they're not going to hold it against them, right? I mean, you look, we love you. You're part of the team. You messed up. Well, if he does it again, we love you. You're part of the team. You messed up. But here's the difference. He just might not put him back in that position again. He may not trust him again, right? May not give him the ball. Friends, Jesus, in spite of Paul blowing it, gave him the ball. He entrusted him to service, to minister on his behalf. Wow. Talk about faith in a messenger of grace. Um, we could really just uh, have a whole message on that first verse there tonight. So, so Paul does go on. I'll, I'll hit a couple other highlights. He does mention his sinfulness. I think that's important for us to be aware of our sinfulness because how can we be cognizant of how blessed we are unless we know how broken we are? I need a savior, y'all, every day. Even when I'm at my best, I'm filled with selfishness, idolatry, trusting other things instead of God, uh, putting my hope in fleeting things. And Paul is very much aware of that. And that's why in our worship tradition, in our service, uh, an important element of our weekly worship at Ripley Presbyterian Church is we have a prayer of confession and a declaration of forgiveness. And then after the forgiveness, what do we do, Jennifer? We sing. And we celebrate that forgiveness. Why do we do that? Because once we consider our sinfulness, we're that much more worshipful and gratitude filled for God. Wow, this is a powerful message by our brother Paul tonight. Um, so once again, he speaks of the grace of God overflowing for me, the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul 
as a good scholar in the first century world often repeats these words. Those words are repeated for a reason. He uses that word faith and once again, love. It's rooted in love. Um, once he states again, the full acceptance. Let's don't just read over these words. In verse 15, he says, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. So once again, Paul used that play on word, just as I was fully accepted by Christ, he gave me the ball again. He entrusted me to serve this message that I'm telling you, you should fully accept, even as I've been fully accepted. Um, so he speaks of the mercy again, not getting what he did deserve. Um, and his hope always goes back to the cross and the gift in the story of life in Christ, where Paul ends verse 16 by saying, uh, Christ did this so he might make me an example uh, of the utmost patience, might me display the utmost patience. Isn't that something we don't talk about enough? What a gift of love patience is. Um, you know, we think about those grandparents in our faith, right? We think of those Elvin Huddlestons who was just an embodiment of patience example who are we patient with we're not patient with people that we don't have deep affection for we're going to be more patient we're going to dote after those that we deeply love god was patient with paul god is patient with you dear soul as you're trying to find your journey find your way it would be so easy for god to give up on us but god's love is patient and long suffering. Um, so that is Paul's message. He ends by saying in verse 17, he was patient to, with me to make me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. You hear what we got to do to get eternal life? Simply put our trust in God, not be perfect, but put our hope in the one who was perfect for us in knowing that we are not enough that the gift of life and salvation is a treasure from heaven for all of us who simply put our hope in the one who can do for us what we can't do alone so for this reason we end verse 17 where paul says once again paul being a great practitioner of worship he comes full circle he gives thanks at the beginning confesses his sin, and then at the end, once again, all the glory goes to God. He's a good Reformed theologian, Paul is. Paul says here, uh, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, be honor and glory forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, that's all I have to say about that. Other reflections <laughs> there, friends? It's just a song cue at the end, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Wasn't too. that beautiful? I knew you'd catch that. <laughs> hey, let me say one more nugget and I'll hush up. This is for my little ones. I've got my young kids, young disciples, young kids, parents of young kids. Let's hold on to that word patience this week. Children of the faith, young disciples. What a gift. God is patient with you parents jody preach to yourself be patient with those god has entrusted you to love most of all amen thank y'all all right jenny lou are you up or is it lenny lou i think it's lenny lou today lenny lou hey, lenny lou i hear I uncle gerald like my friend in the background Lee Bailey putting a lou on everybody he, uh, <laughs> i gotta tell a nugget for, before i forget yeah <laughs> Oh, I love Leon. We had a little memorial for him and I buried his ashes Sunday. And my other dear friends, Patsy Wayne, and no, I miss said that. I was Carol Wayne, to, Carol Wayne, Carol Wayne and Patsy. Hankins and Patsy are, were Leon and Diane's neighbors for years. And Leon drive by and see him and say, hey, Harold Wayne. Hey, Patsy Wayne. So he made her <laughs> Patsy Wayne too. <laughs> love that guy we miss him don't we Lynn every day mm. every day okay I have the Old Testament reading and it is from Exodus 
chapter 32, um, verses 7 through 14. And I am reading from the NIV. And the title at the beginning of the chapter says, The people rebel, but God remains faithful. Well. Wow. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt <laughs> have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord says to Moses, and they are a stiff necked people. Mm. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and mm -hmm. I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Oh, Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, quote, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self? I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Mm. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Um, I just really enjoyed studying this because there's just this central theme that runs through the whole, you know, these lectionary readings. And to me, it is faithfulness. It is God's faithfulness. But there's yeah. steps. There are steps that we have to take. But anyway, um, a little background. Moses has been gone for 40 days. He is up on Mount Sinai with God, receiving the law. And uh, during these 40 days, the Israelites just, they got restless, they got bored, they got worried, and they decided to just take matters in their own hands. And he left Aaron in charge, and Aaron was not very effective. So anyway, Moses and the Lord are up on Mount Sinai. And the Lord turns around and he says, he said, you go down there right now. Your people have just absolutely lost their mind. They are acting out and, and I am hot. I, he said, his <laughs> wrath would burn hot. And God is angry with these people. And he said, you, your people that you brought out of Egypt, Moses, you know. And he said, now let me alone so I can be mad at them. And I'm going to consume them. And then I'm just going to start over with you. I'm going to make you a great nation. Yeah. Um, but right off the bat, you know, he, he left them alone for 40 days, which is, you know, that's quite a bit of time. But they went ahead and broke that first commandment right off the bat. Just knocked it out of the park. No and, uh, and God is making this known to Moses. Moses doesn't have any idea. But Moses, the first thing he does is takes up for those people. He wow, takes man. up for them. That's good. And uh, and so he's telling, he's he's it, it seems like God's judgment is harsh and he's ang quick to anger, but let's just think about that for a minute. He delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Uh, they saw all of that. They witnessed all the signs and wonders. They passed through the waters of the Red Sea, and that wasn't a creek. That's a sea, and it was deep. And if you can imagine those waters parting, I don't imagine you could see the top of them. It would be that deep, and they passed through safely. They saw the destruction of their enemies when God let the sea come back. And he's been taking good care of them. But now, because Moses is just taking too long on the mountaintop, they immediately smash that first commandment to bits and now God is mad. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but there are some clues there that the destruction of the people is not actually God's desire. 
And I found it very interesting in that part where he stated these facts to Moses. And then he said, now let me alone. Now that's just, that's a very curious expression. It is. It's, it's like if, Mo, like, it's like Moses has a say in the matter. Golly, and so it's see. like God's calling on Moses to play some part in the conversation. So mm -hmm. it might result in a different outcome. And I oh. found that very interesting. It was almost like he kind of wanted to see what Moses would do. And we know that Moses does have a role to play. Moses is a prophet. And in fact, he is the prophet. And in Deuteronomy, it says, never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Okay. He, knew him face to face. he was on that mountain with the Lord face to face. And so what does a prophet do? Well, a prophet speaks for God to the people. We talked about that with Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke God's words, but he also speaks for the people to God. It was a, it's good. a two-way street. So in this latter role, when he speaks to God for the people, he speaks for the people. He's often the one that stands in the breach. He's standing in the gap between God and the people. Okay. All right. And it talked about um, the image of that. You can kind of image it in your head is like a defender of a walled city. Okay. When the enemy army wants to come to an, an attack or take a walled city, there's two ways to do it. You can starve them out or you make a breach in the city wall. And so Moses is the defender, called to be the defender of the Israelites and to stand in the breach for them and defend That's them. Good. That's good. So what he does all by himself, he turns away God's wrath and saves the people by using a three-part argument. The first thing, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but I, Moses, this is his initial reaction. He turns the tables on God. <laughs> you know, God would say, you go down at once because your people who brought you brought up out of the land have acted perversely. And Moses kind of says, well, oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people who you, you brought out of Egypt? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it's just not my people, God. These are your people, you know, and it's almost like um, it reminded me. It's almost like they're a married couple and they're talking about their kids. Um, I know yeah. from experience that my three boys who are grown and gone now, but when they were young, if they uh, did something that wasn't nice, they were always my kids. They were my <laughs> kids. They were not Kenny Hill's kids. And I, I tell you, he came home. This was back, golly, 1995 or 96. And we were living across from uh, Bebe and Sampa. Yeah. And uh, he came home and I was fixing supper and he walked in and he said, well, I just got to tell you what your three sons have done. Do you know what your three sons have done? And I thought, no. <laughs> uh, and we walked out in the backyard and there was this dogwood tree that was just beautiful. And it oh, was there no. when we built our house there. And our boys had been watching the Survivor show and they had taken it upon themselves to go out there and build a shelter. And they had taken a, a hatchet and shot yeah. that, that beautiful little dogweed tree down and built a shelter. And they were so proud of it. No, they chopped the whole tree down? <laughs> yes. yes. And when they chopped that tree down, they were my sons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I, I immediately thought of that. I thought that yeah. is just the way it is sometimes. That's right. All right. So the next thing that Moses did, he used the old, what will the neighbors say argument? He thought, he said, now, why should the Egyptians say it was a, with evil intent that God brought you here and destroyed you? He said, he said, he just begged me, he said, just turn away from your fierce wrath, change your mind and don't bring a disaster on your people. Think of your reputation, God. I mean, you proved yourself more powerful than the gods of the Egyptians. Now, what are they going to say if you just wipe them all up? Mm, and that's yeah. almost just like two parents again. 
Yes. There's always going to be one parent that is upset with what's going on. And the other parent typically immediately jumps into the breach to try to diffuse the situation and have a clearer look at what's going on and beg for mercy, as I did, <laughs> with, with your children. And the third part of the argument, that's the clincher. This is, this is what I really think turned the tide. Moses reminded God of his promises, of his covenant. That's good. He said, remember Abraham, remember Isaac, remember in, in, in Israel, all your servants, how you swore to them by to your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land that I promised, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. He's already, he's made that promise. He, he it began with Abraham in Genesis, and it was reiterated time and time again throughout. And Moses' argument works. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on the people. So Moses stood in the breach as God wanted him to. Mm, come I on. Think, you think I think God wanted him to. I think when he said, now let me alone, he was giving Moses that opportunity to stand up. Remember, Moses hasn't seen them. You know, God called them a stiff-necked people. That just basically means they're just a bunch of hard heads, you know, <laughs> act, acting out. And Moses, he hasn't witnessed it, but he immediately stood up and got in, that, got in there and just talked God out of it. Yeah. You know, but uh, I just thought that was so interesting. And um, because the thing is, what it boils down to is God is faithful. He keeps his promises. And Moses, I think, it, he was reminding God of that. But I also think he was reminding himself of that. Because and it, it's not in our scripture, but it almost seemed like God did this. I, I do believe God was angry. I do believe that. But remember, Moses came off that mountain into what was going on and lost his temper yeah, he with did. the kids, you know. But it's almost, to me, almost God was setting the example like, this is what's fixing to happen. You're, you're fixing to see for yourself that they've absolutely lost their mind and Aaron has just let them run wild <laughs> and all these terrible things have happened and you're going to have to jack Aaron up and you're going to have to take care of it and you're going to have to remember that I remembered my promise I am showing them mercy and Moses you're going to have to do that too that's yeah. kind of what I got out of it so it it's like sin true repentance forgiveness and mercy faithfulness always that Faithfulness. He is always faithful. If he promises us, he will, he will not break that promise. And he will love us. And he just, it will be there. But we may suffer because of our stupidity sure. and actions and restlessness. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's always consequences. But I just, I really saw more in this scripture than I ever have. Yeah. God's just so smart and he just teaches us in so many different ways. So anyway, it was just like, well, when I walked, you know, I immediately stood in the breach for my, yeah. my three knuckleheads. Sure. Amen. But later on, I walked down there and I, I grieved that tree. <laughs> I grieved it and I was mad. And True. if I'd had something in my hands, I probably would have thrown it down just like Moses did. But I did not hold it against them, and I forgave them, and I understood Amen. they had didn't do it with evil intent. They were just being boys. Amen. So as parents and, and people when we work with every day, we've got to remember God's steps here. You know, he was angry. You know, sure. we're going to get angry with things. But he remembered these things he remembered his promises that he gave us and we promise our children we're going to love you there are going to be consequences to your actions but i will never stop loving you that's right there's nothing that can separate us so 
it That's affirmed me and made me feel better about when I mess up, when I sin, mm -hmm. if I can just be repentant, try harder next time and ask God to forgive me and understand that I'm, I'm always going to mess up. But if I can do this, God's not going to break his promise to me because he loves hey. me. All right, 60 seconds. I want you you have lived with this text. Brilliant insight. Uh did God change his mind? What tell me what do you think, Lynn? See, God knew he had promised them. Now he can change his mind. God's allowed, he can do anything, he's sovereign. But I do think he changed his mind. I think that Moses put up a good argument. I think it was almost to see what Moses would do sometimes. I think that's right. I'm weak. I think he he wanted to see Moses' reaction. And that those key that key phrase, now let me alone. Now let me alone. And I'll just start over with you. Moses had a great opportunity here. You know, if he didn't jump in there in the breach, he could have just, you know, you're right. Let's just wipe them out and start them, start fresh. It might be easier that way, but he didn't. And um, I just thought that showed great integrity on Moses' part. I do too. Amen. You know, uh, brilliant tonight, y'all. This is the best one ever. I just say that maybe every time, Jennifer. You no pressure, but yeah. we got this thing Thanks. rolling, girl. You better bring it because uh, uh, you got to hurry up and get these uploaded. I'm sending these out to Houston, Texas to a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, I've got Cheryl Bass. I'm trying to get her to come on live, but she won't. I tried to get Kenny Hill to come on live. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, take us away. Um, I have Luke, the gospel, 15 verses 1 through 10. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the NRSV. It's a really familiar chapter of the Bible and passage probably to a lot of people. Yes. Um, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, lays it on his shoulders and rejoices and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, with this, um, let me preface this by saying one of the things that I have uh, Kind of gotten obsessed with watching lately I, I i get on these these kicks watching a series and i'll yeah i'll watch the entire thing um i saw someone recommending this on facebook it's a series called the chosen and it's actually about jesus and the calling of all the disciples in the early ministry wow. and a lot of the dynamic is about the interrelationships among the disciples and how they were such different people that's good. Uh, and it's it's a really neat thing there. Um, what but, channel is that on, Jen? Uh, I'm watching it on Amazon Prime. Okay, cool. There are a couple of different ways, that, places you can watch it. Uh, the first season is, is free, but they have two seasons so far. But um, anyway, the Pharisees were grumbling. Now, the Pharisees were uh, some of the the higher ups in the jewish religious yeah. system and um they were grumbling because of the company that jesus was keeping he was hanging out with the wrong crowd in their mind tax collectors and sinners and they resented it and 
they they kind of thought maybe that undermined his authority. You know, we can't take him seriously because of the company that he's. That's keeping. good. That's good. But in a roundabout way, though, what they were proclaiming is really the good news. You know, Jesus came to welcome everybody, to welcome the sinners, uh, and he he eats with them, and and it, it almost seems like in their mind he's on, he's on their side. Mm, and and yeah. what they don't realize was that was the draw. That was why, you know, throughout the gospel, Jesus chooses to hang out with people that most people wouldn't probably yeah. at that time period. He offered them something that nobody else ever had oh, or maybe no. ever would. Um, in all of his relationships with these sinners, he wanted to bring them to repentance, but never did he do so in a way like, you better repent. You've done bad, bad things or, or try to correct them. He, he just eats with them and he, he sort of embraces them with his favor. And I think that's probably why so many people were drawn to him. They could sense a, a kinship with him, a friendship with him. Uh, and literally, that's you know, good. eating with people, that's such a, a huge thing in the South, you know, we're always planning the next meal and, and what we're going to do and, and who's going to be there. And the great thing about Jesus's table is you didn't have to wonder who was invited. Everybody was. Oh, I love it. Everybody is invited. And um, I think that that's the point that the Pharisees missed. And Jesus was, was trying to give them a chance maybe to see hey, you know what, you're so caught up in all of these religious rituals and observances that you have that you're missing the whole point of the gospel. You're missing the whole point of the Bible. Yeah. You're missing the big picture of what God wants you to do. And so he tells a story uh, or two different parables in, in what I have, but throughout uh, this particular chapter, there's three parables about things yeah. that are lost. Of course, there's the lost sheep, which is one out of a hundred. And, you know, percentage wise, there's 1%. Then you've got the woman who lost one out of 10 coins, there's 10%. And then what I don't have later, of course, is the prodigal son, 50% right there. So it's, it's like each time it's like it's, it, it's a greater percentage. But I think that uh, what's so important is that through these different stories, number one, people who were hearing them could relate to them. I mean, who hasn't lost something? You know, if I don't lose my keys or one of my shoes at least every other day, I mean, would I be thinking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I think that what's so good about it is in all of the stories he tells about being lost, never once is there blame. Is there like, oh, why did that stupid sheep get lost? Or where did that yeah. stupid coin go? It's all about concern for what's lost searching for it finding it and rejoicing over it that's good and i think that's so very important and i think it's a message for us about the way god looks at us and and his faithfulness towards us he actively seeks out the people who are lost and he searches for them in fact most of the time god finds the sinner before the sinner finds god yes ma'am he, he's always with us and I think what's also really important to realize is that really good people can still be really lost at the same time. Wow. You know, just because you're a good person doesn't mean that sometimes we can't get lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you take the example of the sheep, um, you know, back when, when we read about King David, you know, shepherds kind of had it going on, you know, uh, David has sort of given shepherds a good rap, you know, oh, be, a shepherd, <laughs> be like David. But at this time in history, shepherds weren't very well respected. You know, no good father wanted his daughter to marry no good shepherd. They couldn't come mm -hmm. to worship. Uh, they had to watch the sheep all the time. They didn't get to celebrate the Sabbath. Uh, if you were Mike Rowe and you were hosting, hosting dirty jobs back then, Shepherd would have been one of those jobs that you would have would have probably uh, shown wow. on your program. Sheep, uh, they're not the brightest, um, but the shepherd would always know 
the sheep by his flock, probably by name, probably had named them. And the sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. I like it. And, and I think that's, that's, you know, the fact that the shepherd was willing to go in search of their lost animal, even when that could take a whole day or longer, you know, to find that animal and then putting it over its shoulders, you know, an act of gentleness, an act of comfort. I thought that was, that was really nice. Yeah. And then, then you have um, the woman who has lost this coin, which I looked up, uh, they said probably a drachma, which would have been the equivalent of about one day's wage. Yeah. Um, but she's doing everything. She's She's lighting a lamp. She's sweeping the house. She's searching carefully. She goes to a lot of inconvenience on her part to find this coin, which it is valuable, but not so valuable, you know, that she necessarily has to use that much energy to do it. Okay. But it's important. She's lost it and she, she wants it back. She wants to find it. Um, the thing that I thought, uh, is that sometimes gives people a little trouble you know there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance and one of the things that I think is so important or it's it's something that I read in a commentary and it resonated with me is it's important to be if we are lost or in those times when we feel lost to be one of those people who know that we need to repent and are willing to do so mm -hmm. rather than being like, let's say a Pharisee who has no idea that they need repentance. It's so important to be somebody who knows that you need it. Um, and the, the, um, the fact is that, you know, ultimately we all have a seat at God's table. We all matter to him. And I don't think it's necessarily a story about like, good Jesus versus the bad Pharisees I just mm -hmm. think it's it's all about what we are called to do I think it's a heart issue I think Jesus wants us you know to seek out the lost as well I don't think it's just a job for God and for Jesus I think it's for all of us that's good and I think it's something that you know we don't do begrudgingly like okay Jesus wants me to go help these people uh, you know, that I, I might not normally hang out with, that might not normally be somebody I would invite to my table, because maybe they think differently than I do. Maybe they don't believe all the same things I do. Maybe they don't dress the way I do. Maybe they don't have the same values I do. But the thing about it is that nowhere in the gospel or anywhere in the Bible do we ever get a guarantee that following Jesus is going to be comfortable or convenient. And I think it's it's something that we have to think of our priorities and, and kind of get them straight in our heads. And I think that when we do that, finding the broken people um, is, is a priority that goes way up and our own comfort goes way down. And I think it's so important that we, we ask ourselves, are we getting that right? Are we doing you know, what, what we hope to do or what we feel like maybe would be the Christ-like way to live our lives. And so it, it reminded me so much of our mission statement to glorify and love God and love people, but so important to meet them where they are. You know, if they're lost, we meet them when they're lost and we encourage them towards that joyous relationship with God. And I looked at this passage in a completely different way with all of that in my head. You know, I had always thought, oh, you know, be happy when you find things that are lost. But I just think, you know, it's it's deeper. It's yeah. so much deeper. Uh, and, and I just think that, you know, in leaving you, I would just say that it's important to realize that God is faithful to us. He's always with us and that he is constantly with us in our daily lives. And we have his ongoing presence and ongoing faithfulness with us, uh, if only we ask for it. Hey, Amen. Got a question for you. I asked Liam one. All right, you said it, the Bible never promises to be comfortable or convenient, I think. I'm paraphrasing. Right. Why? Why would we do it then? Why do we embrace this space that following Jesus isn't comfortable or convenient? 
I just feel like, you know, we've been given such a gift with yeah. Jesus. It's not a gift that's just for us. It's a gift for everybody. And yeah. we have to be willing to share that gift with others. I think that's part of it. It's, it's kind of like a parent who has one child and then they have more children. You know, it just that's shows great. them how big their heart is. That's great. And it's work, isn't it? Lynn yeah. was having to work. Take, but there's a joy there, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Love it, Jen. That's beautiful. I tell you what, I put pressure on her. I believe she beat me in Norris. I don't know if she beat Lynn, yeah. but this was a knock it out of the park yeah. night. Y'all people on Facebook, share this with your friends. If they Thank need you. to know they are loved, if they need to know God is faithful, if they need to know that grace abounds and that we all are in need of a savior, please share this and lift somebody's week. I think it was a great gift to me. Jennifer, that was tremendous. Lynn, outstanding. Y'all, y'all filled my cup. Who prayed last week? I think Doc did. Okay. Would you like to pray for us, ma'am? Sure. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this study this evening. We thank you that you have given us such a great gift in your son. We thankful. We are so thankful for the gift of your faithfulness to us. We know that no matter how lost we get, Father, there's always a home come, to come back to with you. Forgive us for when we do fail you. And please, when we do ask um, for your forgiveness, grant it to us. Uh, as we go forth tonight, we ask you to be with those in our community who are sick, those who are facing illness, and those who are grieving loss. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank y'all so much. God bless you. you all. Wonderful mm -hmm. evening. Bye. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.